Stefan Sogna, um, Stefan Sogna is um, um, uh, the chair of the Department of History and Humanities and a philosophy professor at John Cabot University in Rome. And he's also the director and co-founder of the uh, Beyond Humanism Network, a fellow at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies, research fellow at the UR Institute for Humanities. And uh, he has published broadly on the theme of uh, transhumanism uh, and is also uh, the uh, editor in chief and founding editor of the Journal of Posthuman Studies. Uh, so we will start uh, with the uh, presentation by uh, Paul uh, and Matthias uh, on the uh, human principle. Thank you very much, Francesco, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today on this lovely terrace of John Cabot's University in Rome. And uh, Matthias and me, we're all uh, student friends. We have been chatting and talking and discussing these issues for 30 years. And so this book is really a work of friendship. Um, and um, it poses the question of power, namely, does technological power combine with economical power? transform into power over societies and individuals in the sense that it undermines democracy and undermines individual freedom. And that's actually the question our book is asking. And I think the conviction which we share is that certainly in this technological heap now uh, with us already and even more before us, there's a risk of this happening. Um, and uh, the book therefore starts with a very detailed analysis of the economical power and technological power. In fact, we identify the eight sources of power of the big uh, corporations, which are both at number one to five of the American Stock Exchange, but which are also the companies which are in the driving seat of composing AI elements into functioning systems. Of course, AI, artificial intelligence, is being researched all over the world today. But the ability to uh, put all elements of AI together into functioning system really resides with these five uh, major companies, which in abbreviation we call GAFAM, namely Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft. So these companies, as the first source of power, are the richest and most capitalized companies in the world. In fact, um, I just saw uh, yesterday that uh, since we delivered the manuscript of the book, the value of these companies doubled. The joint capitalization value of these companies is now the combined value of the German and Japanese economy, just these five companies. So that's the first source of power. And we have to be conscious in this age that we're not only talking about technology, we're talking about a combination of economic power and technology. So money is real power in terms of uh, influence in democratic process and uh, both in America and in Europe, this is well known probably in America even more than in Europe. So that's the first source of power of these companies. The second source of power of these companies is that they control the networks of public opinion building. We know from empirics, both in the United States and Europe, that an increasing number of people, probably by now 50% of our population, build their opinions in the electronic public sphere, as Frank Pasquale, uh, uh, called um, these networks, in particular the platforms of uh, social networks, um, and also simply by Google search, for example. And controlling these networks and being those who decide who sees what, because these companies, they design the algorithms which deliver content to us, and therefore they decide what we get to see, is a huge position of power, a gatekeeper power in democracy. And another source of power uh, for these companies, which we look at very closely, is the collection of personal data. Personal data is data which identifies individuals or makes it possible to identify individuals. And depending on the company, they profile any individual which is uh, moving on the internet and actually also off the internet. I can explain in a moment how that works with between 200 and 2000 parameters. Thus, 
uh, these companies know much more about us as individuals than our family members, friends, and often I would say even ourselves. And this gives them enormous power of targeting messages, micro-targeting, being very precise, telling us exactly uh, what uh, they think we should be hearing. And um, as I said, um, this is not only done today by collecting data from the internet, but increasingly also one has to be conscious of this. It's also offline collection, you know, for example, when you move with your mobile phone in a department store, if you have Wi-Fi on or Bluetooth on, um, there will be most likely a transmission of where you just stop and what you're just now looking at. Or credit card data is bought uh, by these companies to combine credit card information from your transactions, also offline transactions, if you go to a store and just pay with your credit card um, and the information they collect on you on the internet. So that is um, the third um, source of power. And um, if we then um, go on uh, and ask ourselves, how is money uh, operationalized um, in terms of gaining even more power? There is the process of lobbying. The old time lobbying is the idea that you directly influence members of parliaments or members of governments. The modern time lobbying is that you have the ambition to influence all spaces of public opinion building. So what we see, uh, what these companies are doing, they are buying into university institutes in the sense that it's very hard today to find faculties which do research on the relationship between technology and society where there's not money from at least one of these um, companies present. In Germany, that's very prevalent. We have the examples of the Humboldt uh, University Institute in Berlin which received 14 million from Google. We have the University of uh, Munich, where uh, the Essex on the internet uh, research chair received 7 million from Facebook. And you know one could make a long list um, of these injurances. And the same is happening in the press. So while the press, the media, uh, the fourth estate, uh, so important for our democracy in terms of controlling power, is you losing revenues because in the new um, economy of online advertisement, uh, two companies only, namely Google and Facebook, combine 80% of the new online revenue uh, in their hands. Um, the press is losing out. And uh, now we see that the press is being financed um, from these companies by gracious donations, which of course creates new dependencies and power relationships between the powerful and those who are normally called upon to check on the power, because that's the role of, uh, of the uh, force of state. And um, the uh, research power, of course, uh, all this money, the ability to work with each of them around a budget of 10 billion euros a year, with thousands of researchers to develop AI to be front runners, uh, on this technology must be mentioned and also must be mentioned and Matthias, um, who is the philosopher of us uh, too, I'm uh, the lawyer and uh, policy maker. Uh, Ma Matthias will say more about this. Uh, an important source of uh, power is also, um, uh, I would say, uh, a rather well-built um, ide ideology which, uh, which supports um, uh, these companies and which we call uh, and which others have called uh, the California ideology, which is actually an ideology which claims that all great problems of this world can be solved by technology. So that's the first part of our book. It's really a critical assessment and doing what sociologists already called in the 90s, the most important task of democracy to check on power, including on technological power. That's the first part of the book. And the book has a V form. We are first going down, it's very negative, you know, we have to criticize. And I think that's very important in social science. We often now today talk about trust in technology, but at least Matthias and me, we happen to believe that critical assessment of power remains key in free societies. And we must have a critical uh, attitude towards power, whether it's public power or private power. So that's what we start with in the book. And then when we are at the bottom uh, and you know, have criticized a lot, uh, then things turn around and we develop a positive vision starting out with the history of uh, democracy and what it can mean uh, today and in the future. That's a big part of uh, philosophy also. And at the end of the book, I would just like to mention, we return to practical politics and ask the question, what can we do? And um, 
the answer there is complex. It's not just one golden bullet, which um, you know, we may find here and there and which may solve all problems of this world related to GAFAM and uh, their power over democracy or, or, or individuals. Uh, many things have to be done in the political process. One thing is clear, what we are pleading for is to reestablish the primacy of democracy and law um, over technology and business models. Um, if we want to continue to live freely, we believe um, it is necessary that um, we return to the law, the law being the most noble instrument of democracy. We have a long history of decades behind us in neoliberalism in which law was talked down or always considered just a cost factor and a nuisance and an obstacle to innovation. And at the same time, um, we have a democracy crisis and uh, we happen to believe that uh, we must address the democracy crisis, but also reestablish primacy of democracy over technology by making good use of the law. So also ethics talk, the famous ethics on AI in our view is not enough. And what should these laws prescribe? There are many things which they have to prescribe. And I would just mention one thing, which I think is very, very important. For example, the law has to prescribe in an obligatory fashion that people are always made aware when they deal with artificial intelligence. It cannot be that we as humans don't realize anymore, are we actually talking in terms of spoken language or with written messages to a machine, um, especially when we come to a closer to the democratic process, it's very, very important to know is the human talking or is a machine talking. Democratic processes don't work anymore if we don't realize uh, you know, all the great messages about this or that candidate, which we may find on our screens may actually come from machines. So we need, for example, such transparency rules which make people aware, attention, now you talk to, to a machine if it's not already evident. And we are now in an age where it's not evident anymore. And there are many companies which actually aim to make it less evident, you know, to make language sound like it's a human speaking or messages look as if it's a great debate with a, a human intellectual. That's one of many examples. So we have a catalog of political prescriptions um, at the end, which also make people understand what thinking underlies the very concrete measures which the European Union and the European Commission are now working on in legislation in the form of the data, uh, um, uh, the, the data Markets Act and um, uh, the Digital Services Act, the AI Act. We have a whole batch of legislation now moving forward in, uh, in Brussels. And uh, the book is not going into the details of this legislation, but it explains the underlying political thinking of that legislation. So much from me about the politics of this book and over to Matthias for the philosophical part. Yes, thank you very much uh, <clears throat> for having me and uh, having the chance to say something to our book and what we um, try to point it out there. It's um, my role is not only, um, so to say, philosopher to, to try to understand what's going on in this kind of Cal Californian ideology uh, that Powell pointed out, but as well as a journalist which worked for 30 years in TV journalism and uh, which uh, was very close to the transformation that is going on through digitalization. Uh, it's a transformation in the media, which is very, very radical and which uh, means that. Uh, this industry uh, is one of the industries that will be uh, completely be transformed within the next years, uh, like the music industry, for example, um, which was much earlier. But the difference between the journalism and other industries is that journalism is vital to democracy. That's what Paul said. Uh, we can only live in a democracy um, as long as we, uh, as we do have free access to information and the possibility to exchange information very free and to build own opinions upon that. We need therefore, um, as uh, is it called, the fourth estate, which is the press, which is independent from the state, which gives um, people uh, access to this information and uh, which was not only uh, neutral uh, in any case uh, during the age of the mass media, but which is very, very uh, in a dangerous uh, condition right now in the electronic era. Why is that? Because um, we have that shift 
uh, of money from the advertising industry, which is one of the basis of, of the media. Um, and uh, the money goes to the online. Uh, online um, information is more or less without journalists because uh, they are replaced by um, everyone. You know, everyone is a producer of news as well as a consumer in these days. Uh, and uh, on the other side, by algorithms. Uh, in the US, almost uh, like 40% of all news coverage is made by algorithms. All the texts are written by machines. That started with weather reports and sport reports and, 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 and stock exchange report, but it goes on and on and on. And the new um, AIs are very, very, very good in telling stories. Um, they made even some um, tests with these AIs and they showed up that uh, people believed in these stories, which were completely uh, fantastic, um, more than in stories which were done by real journalists. So that's a very big threat. Uh, these machines are getting better and better in terms of um, um, simulating something which is, comes close to our thinking, but it's not our thinking. And this is the next point I wanted to, to focus on. Uh, Paul spoke about the uh, threat on, on, on law and um, the bashing on law during the last years of neoliberal um, 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 discussions, we also have a bashing of reason. Human reason is under threat. Um, it is under threat by the technology of AI on the one hand, and is under threat uh, by a discussion in our society, which points out irrationalism and relativism, which uh, denies the universal power of human reason, which is able and capable to, um, uh, to form international and universal norms and laws, uh, which can be a basis of, um, of a, a human and a worldwide understanding. What we have in these days is only a planetary technology, but not a planetary reason and not a planetary kind of understanding between humans. These falls more and more into relatively um, and cultural given things and perspectives and misses more and more the universal um, aspect of rationality, which was uh, created and pointed out, uh, not at least here in this area, during the period of the Renaissance. So um, in a way, our book is a plaidoyer for a new kind of Renaissance of human reason, of humanity. Um, we have a big challenge with these new kind of technology. The most powerful technology that was ever invented is artificial intelligence. Because uh, if it succeeds in getting better than human reason and human thinking, it will take over power. That's not a science fiction kind of thing, but that's a real threat. We see that step by step and in very little, um, um, uh, very little developments, but it can be seen uh, if you open your eyes um, um, right now. So therefore, we come to the conclusion that um, this shift of power to technology from societies, from autonomous uh, individuals uh, must be controlled and must be shaped in a way that the rule of law is uh, re-established and not the rule of code is established in the future. Uh, this would mean that um, uh, the, the rule of law is the only opportunity to have um, a human society with high technology, a human society uh, without rule of law and under the rule of, uh, of code uh, won't work as a human society, that's for sure. So um, finally, this um, as well uh, points out that we need action first in the media. Uh, we propose, for example, uh, a European media platform, which is an alternative to the um, platforms of Google, of GAFAM and the other companies. They only work in a destructive way for democracy and autonomy. And we need one which works, uh, which works in, a, in, a, in, a, in another way and which uh, fills out the, um, the, the law um, and that we already have. <clears throat> and on the other side, we need a debate about what is really artificial intelligence? Is it really superior to human reason or is it only a part of human reason, which is uh, you know, made uh, much faster than it may be, 
but uh, which is only limited to um, a mathematical and uh, calculation and which is not capable of a lot of other um, capabilities of human reason, which we urgently need for a future, for a better future. So that's my point. Thank you very much. And um, hope uh, I took some uh, of the interesting points of this very, very big book. So it's over 450 pages. <laughs> yes, it was hard work. It's not possible to uh, all refer it in 20 minutes. <clears throat> So thank you very much, uh, Paul and Matthias. So up next is uh, Stefan, Professor Stefan Sogner. And um, I'll give you the floor. Many thanks. For the Many thanks for that kind introduction, dear Francesco, and also for the clear outline uh, the authors have given concerning the book Prinzip Mensch, Human as a Principle. Um, I do share, and my book, my forthcoming book, we've always been cyborgs, does share sort of the concern for liberalism, for the achievements of the Enlightenment. And so we've got many, many goals actually in common and central concerns in common. However, the solution the authors present, from my perspective, they undermine actually these achievements. They actually lead to an erosion of liberal democracy. So I've got, I've got severe concerns concerning the solution which is being presented. And uh, furthermore, um, this is also, I think it is connected to the anthropology, to the understanding of who human beings are, which is, which is part of the book, Principal Human Being, because it is quasi antagonistic. It's to the, to the outline I'm presenting in the book, we've, we've always been cyborgs. Sort of, it's because the understanding it starts and, and Matthias has made that extremely explicit um, when he stressed sort of, it's the reason human has, uh, uh, anima rationalis, as a, as a rational animal, which goes back and, and has determined the entire Western tradition since at least Plato, but then made particularly strong in the Renaissance, where they referred to human dignity later on to Kant, and which is still an understanding which is widely being shared all over the world, which is part of the foundational laws of the law, foundational laws and constitutions in most countries all over the world. But is actually this, this understanding of human being is, is, is the most critical problem and has led to many of the problematic discriminatory structures with which we are currently uh, concerned. It is this understanding of anthropology which has led to sexism, racism, speciesism, and um, aletheism. And basically the central issues which are so widely discussed today. And that's why it's a, it's an, my, my book is an attempt to transcend, to twist, to move away from this dualistic understanding uh, of humanity, which has you know, been dominant in the Western tradition, then taken over the rest of the world quasi in a, in a, in a colo colonial, quasi colonial move. Um, and which is still part of the, at the heart of, of the book, Principal, Principal Human. So we have been cyborgs, it's, it's non-essentialist. It proposes a non-essentialist understanding of human beings. It proposes a non-dualist understanding of human beings. And it also um, proposes a non-anthropocentric understanding of human beings. And all of these other uh, notions can actually be found implicit in the, in the concept principle human being, you're human as a principle. It's anthropocentric, essentialist, and dualistic. And as a consequence of these structures, these very discriminatory structures have came about. They are not directly necessarily connected to it, but they've been historically developed together with it. Sort of the understanding of the male as the rational, the woman as the emotional. The rational is the good. That's the 
you know, um, the one in power. Um, with Plato, we enter the light, the colorful, uh, the, the, the whiteness as what is desired, darkness as people of color as being, you know, rejected of lower value. It's been um, the sexism is, which is implicit. So it's rational, uh, rationality connected to maleness, emotionality of females. So it's implicit sexism, racism, anthropocentrism, which is connected to the anthropos, only humans possess rationality. So that's why I, I regard this anthropology as extremely problematic concerning the connotations which have been developed. And it's, it's the attempt of the book, uh, we've, we've always been cyborgs to present an alternative anthropology, firstly, to, to twist, to move away from the connected discriminatory structures, which have been connected to the traditional anthropology. And in that way to develop a new ethics, it's the liberal ethics um, of fictive autonomy, which I'm developing, I've been developing in this forthcoming new book. And I will apply these findings or apply this new anthropology in particular to two of the most promising the most powerful technologies with which we are concerned, namely, um, well, digital technologies and gene technologies. And sort of what would be the implications on the basis of, um, on the basis of, of this anthropology concerning these various, uh, uh, concerning these various technologies and which approach we should take. And Sort of in order to focus on and now to basically move back to the first point as a, as a response concerning uh, the meaning of digital data and the, and the suggestions for revision, um, which have just been presented, I, 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 will, I, I wish to highlight and I do highlight in the book um, in how far these suggestions are implausible or well, actually they undermine the interests of Europe they undermine, they might even undermine the structures of a liberal democracy. Um, be, besides all the other issues, just mentioned the possible discriminatory structure, which are rather connected with the implicit anthropology and not, and, and not so much now with the, um, with the new technologies, even though this would have to be more specified and analyzed in more detail by dealing with the various technologies in, in, in in, in well, well, by dealing specifically with each technology. So I do also share the basic analysis um, concerning various concerning the libertarian US American way of dealing and the power connected with Google and Facebook. And I'm, I'm as concerned as they are with basically all the, you know, the power connected to the data collection, the abuse in the media, the influencing of, of the political structures of the political system. Um, the very is, or maybe more than a very, um, is that I think the solution which is being presented actually undermines the very foundations of a functional, liberal, enlightened um, democracy as we have it, as we have it here uh, in, in Europe. In the book, I firstly deal when we talk about digital technologies, I firstly deal with such issues as artificial intelligence, artificial general intelligence, the very, which was also mentioned before, like AI taking over, um, overpowering humans, putting humans in, into the zoo at the end, maybe AI being so strong. And in the first part, I actually show, or I, I try to show, well, this is not so much a worry which ought to concern us nowadays. It's, it's not that I fear these, or it's not that I exclude this development, but I guess, but I guess it's, um, um, I include the, these developments, but, but sort of in order for these, these consequences to actually come about, um, that will be much further in the future. Sort of these visions presented by Elon Musk that in 20, 30 years times, we will be able to upload our personalities onto, onto a hard drive, onto the internet. We don't, this is like the discussion we've had in the Middle Ages, um, where they discussed basically how many, how many angels fit on the tip of a needle. 
Um, it's 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 sort of this. It's comparable because um, on the background of the medieval structures, it made sense to discuss the size of angels because everyone shared sort of the Christian background. Nowadays, every, everyone shares, everyone shares sort of that technological understanding us turning into being quasi computers, we can upgrade ourselves and, 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 and um, create, create digital clones of ourselves. That's sort of widely shared up in the air. That's why sort of this idea resonates so strongly with, with many people. Um, but, but I mean, must suggestion that we will in 30 years or 20 years time be able to do so it, it lacks any solid foundation because it is it is rather musk's way and he's very successful in doing so musk and his friends from the university of oxford his way of getting into the media and getting on the cover pages and maybe actually um putting sand into the eyes of the of the of the masses by letting them talk about mind uploading, which is a fascinating idea, but we have no reason whatsoever to think that this will be possible in the next 20 to 30, 40 years. Um, we don't even have, I mean, it would have to assume that we actually would continue to live on a, on a, on a hard drive in a digital mode. We don't even have a concept of, a, of any living entity, of any digital living entity. But if we actually manage to do so, sort of put ourselves onto hard drives, our personality, we wouldn't only have to be living, but also conscious, but also self-conscious, and so on. And, and this is just, we're very, very far away. But I'm not saying I'm excluding the possibility that sort of AGI, artificial general technology, taking over and putting humans into the zoo is not something which we should, we should, be, we should be concerned with. However, and therefore must actually successfully is very successful in, in moving us away from the real issues, from the real pressing issues. And they have also been, these pressing issues have been identified by the, by the authors of the book, uh, Human as a Principle. Um, and, and these are the meaning of digital data and the power connected. I'm in perfect agreement with them. This is the central uh, issue which, with which we need to be concerned. So, um, but instead of, but actually the authors themselves by presenting their solution, they don't take seriously the, the premises from which they started. <laughs> In the sense, uh, they, they, they analyze the importance, the power connected with the meaning of digital data. But in the end, what they said, no, we must undermine, we must cherish privacy. We must not allow sort of collecting digital data. Well, what are the consequences if that happens? We, we, we basically uh, uh, freely giving away the power which is connected to that. And that has economic consequences um, because of the collection of the meaning of, 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 digital, uh, of digital data. And, and, and the meaning must never be underestimated. It is connected. So any kind of research in the natural sciences, in the social sciences, innovation, um, developing new technologies is closely, is closely related now to big data analysis. And that's what we need the collection of digital data for. And that is being difficult in, within the regulations as they are now present in, in, in Europe and which are also defended in, in the aforementioned book. And therefore we undermine the, one of the most powerful sources connected um, with, with economic well-being. Econ not only economic, scientific well-being, but also personal well-being. Why personal well-being? Because health needs to be financed. Um, and that's one of the central, from my perspective, one of the most important achievements which we have here in Europe. It's not only sort of that enlightened liberalism or democratic liberalism which we have, but it's also the understanding that the, the public, the general public health insurance is, is, you know, a precious achievement. Everyone should be covered because, because health or in an increased health span is such a constitutive part of living a good life. And health insurances are extremely important, extremely costly and expensive. Um, and so all of these issues now by us giving away or not allowing or making it difficult to collect the digital data, um, it basically undermines our interest and the power connected to the digital data. And the, the form is analysis acknowledges sort of, sort of the widely shared statement, data is in new oil. 
Uh, again, data and oil are not identical. Oil is a natural resource. Data is intellectual property that has different implications, but both are connected to power, to economic, to money, to, you know. And so, um, and if we acknowledge this, then this has consequences for Europe. And we make it difficult to let these data collect and use it for various purposes. And I agree with them actually, in the sense, given the, uh, the current arrangement of, of digitalization of technology, I'm personally terribly scared of giving, giving up my privacy. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I'm aware sort of the sanctions connected to it, both on a legal level, on an institutional level, on a personal level, enormous. The risk of abuse is, is absolutely terrifying. And that's why I, I do share the strong concerns for privacy. But for practical purposes, I, I don't... So my, 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 my counter suggestion um, in the sense of taking these issues serious, and we need to find a way of collecting the data in order to, to, to uphold the well-being also to paying sort of the, the, the public health insurance by means of the, 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 the money we generate by co having collected the data um, is, is so important that it mustn't be, mustn't be given up. Um, so um, please interrupt me if I talk up because I could. Like a to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, I could continue <laughs> just like, um, this. So, um, and, and the solution is basically um, sort of the counter suggestions actually by, by um, recognizing um, the importance of um, uh, data collection and also the importance sort of in the global sector, us being part of a global war concerning digital data. That's what all the countries are trying to work on. And most efficient are, is, is China in that respect. Because they not only, I mean, they've not only created the Chinese wall, they've also created the Chinese firewall. So only the Chinese companies and the China, with the Chinese companies, also the Chinese government have the right to collect the, 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 the data within China and they can legally enforce it. And they have to collect enormous amounts of data. But in addition to that, you know, they've got TikTok and WeChat or whatever, and they can collect data in the rest of the world. YouTube and, 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 and Facebook cannot collect the data within China. So the internet is not even no longer a global entity. So here, the, the power connected to the data was acknowledged. And now we see China as a global player who has, can legally enforce the data collection with all the corresponding and correlating power, economic well-being, um, which, which goes along with it. And I mean, so far concerning period publications, China has or already overtaken um, the United States concerning the quantity, and that shows something. And that shows the development. I don't see how China in the global competition for, for digital data can be stopped actually in the, in the forthcoming years. However, if, if we take seriously the importance of digital data, the, what the consequences will be for Europe will be clear. Um, the consequent, you know, the only thing we, we will be of no relevance whatsoever concerning innovation, you know, technological innovation, scientific innovation, studies in natural sciences, economic sciences, social sciences. Um, the only reason why people, why Americans and, 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 and Eastern Asia or Chinese uh, will come to Europe will be, well, you know, we've got the Colosseum, we've got pizza, we've got pasta, we've got the Louvre, you know, touristic events, but everything connected to finances, scientific innovations, technological innovations will be, you know, of no relevance whatsoever. Of course, I'm, I'm overstating things, but I think that maybe not even so much. Um, so this is my, my, my deep-rooted, very connected, um, or a couple of my deeply rooted, very connected to the suggestions presented in the book, um, Human as a Principle. Thank you. So there's a, there's a lot, let me all, I want to put all of you on spotlight. Um, all right. Um, 
So as I suspected, there's a, there's a lot to discuss. So let's do, let's do an exercise, right? Um, describe the world 10 years from now, best case scenario, worst case scenario, AI has been developed by whom, how. So describe the best, best case scenario for what the world should look like in 10 years from now. And what is the worst case scenario? Because to me, it seems that there's um, uh, overlaps in uh, actually more than, uh, than I thought that there would be. Uh, but there's also, there's a, there's a sense of optimism and there's a sense of a perception of risk. Uh, but in reality, I can't really pinpoint uh, what the optimism that you have might lead to and uh, what the pessimism or the control uh, that you are describing uh, might lead to. Uh, what you have in common uh, is certainly this idea of humanity and the role of humanity. Uh, you've been talking about the human renaissance and the function of uh, uh, humanity in general. Uh, you pointed out uh, what is a, a contemporary discussion about the position of humans in a more complex ecosystem, right? So you've been talking about anthropocentrism, uh, and which I find really interesting uh, because uh, you use the, the dichotomy of anthropocentrism versus uh, multi pluralism or what you might call someone calls it deep ecology the the, the concept of uh, all life being equally entitled to being uh, alive uh, but the reality is that uh, to me i see ai as the ultimate form of anthropocentrism it's designed by humans uh, there's no other contribution from any other species so i see it as a the ultimate anthropocentric mechanistic, mechanistic uh, statement. So let's do this exercise because, uh, so what, what is a good world gonna look like in 10 years from now? And uh, what is a bad world? Because uh, if we have to develop artificial intelligence in the end, it should be because we need it, right? I mean, we shouldn't develop just because we can. We have to develop it because it has to solve problems. If the only thing it solves is moving money from one pocket to another, I don't think that's a very good distribution of power. That's not a very good aim. So I think that it's about vision and people should be able to give bodies to their vision and their fears so that people can understand these visions and can understand these fears. So I'd like to know what's your vision for AI in 10 years and what's your fear for AI in, in, in 10 years. What are the key players, what is gonna happen? So uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll just follow the, 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 the same uh, uh, kind of uh, order we did uh, before. All right, worst uh, vision is that individuals have completely lost control uh, over uh, their personal data. They feel a constant chill of being under surveillance by the state which has argued successfully that it needs to know it all for public interest and for crime prevention, and also under surveillance by uh, very powerful providers of services, which are uh, monopolistic in, in nature. And uh, AI in that context uh, serves exclusively the powerful. It serves to optimize the profits of the monopolistic companies and it uh, serves to optimize the work in particular of the security complex to you know, predictive, um, predictive arrests, you know, keeping people out of crime uh, you know, in, the, in, the, in the vision, which has been, have been in movies already, that uh, people are arrested before they have committed a crime because their data shows that they're most likely to, to commit a crime very soon. Most positive vision is a vision in which the dream of the decentralization through the internet, the personal computer, this vision is realized again, um, where, where people are, where the structures of technology, the modern technologies have allowed to decentralize innovation, to decentralize uh, control and use of technology. There are many choices to be made by individuals. Um, and in particular, there is a new type of uh, technology which empowers 
uh, individuals to to lead their life and also to control um, how they are, uh, you know, maybe being subject of AI or subject of of data collection, um, and um, maybe also a world in which people have more time again and more leisure to engage as humans again uh, uh, in the democratic process. Um, and uh, you know to to shape the world in other ways than just through technology. It can be through love and personal relationships, but it can also be through teaming up with people and getting organized and understanding each other. So, I would say um, you know uh, my positive vision for the world is if we overcome the biggest scarcity which we have in this world, which is the ability to agree together to do things uh, together. Um, um, if we learn again that humans, uh, you know, do best, um, and and it's in the human nature to do things together, and that we learn to agree again in political processes domestically, uh, but even also internationally. The worst vision is that um, it's a scenario where um, the humans failed in uh, getting control over this technology. Um, and um, this would have several consequences, among them the complete loss of uh, individuality, of uh, autonomy and on, on freedom and democracy. Um, second, it would mean that it's not possible without humans controlling the technique uh, instead of um, being controlled by, by technology. Uh, that we solve the biggest problem that we have actually with the climate change and with uh, covering uh, all these questions that are connected to this, which means that we should um, that we that we have to act um, for the life on the planet. Uh, we can only do that if we, and this is the best case, um, uh, if we keep control over that technology and if we solve the control problem. The control problem is, a, is a, the, these are two problems. The first one is the um, is the technological control problem. It's discussed in the AI um, uh, discourse as the control problem. Nick Bostrom pointed that out, for example, and it means that it's not sure that the self improvement of these machines can be stopped and can be leaded by us anymore within the next ten or fifteen or twenty years. If that happens. We have really a big problem because look at what kind of processes are already completely steered and controlled by AI systems like the financial system, like our whole ecosystem with water supply, with, with electricity and stuff like that. So we need to uh, solve the control problem technologically, but on the other hand, we need to solve it politically. Uh, and that means that technology is not in power, but democracy and law is still in power. And um, looking back to 10,000 years of civilization, we have one experience with power, that power always leads to abuse. And the best system to control power turned out to be democracy since yet. I mean, it's like Churchill pointed it out. It's, it's, well, it's bad, but it's the, it's, it's, it's a, the, 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 um, the, the the thing that is among all the bad solutions is the at least bad. So, and we have to uh, to see that the control of power uh, is uh, based on the control by reasonable people and autonomous people in person. And that's uh, our controversy here. I mean, um, reason is the most noble ability of humans, of mankind. It brought where we are actually. I mean, all this technology, all the, the good um, things on earth are made by reason and by reasonable people. And in the situation where we, where we, where we develop a technology which claims um, to, to take over this reason by a so-called artificial intelligence, um, we must see that that's a threat to our not only picture of ourselves, but, um, um, but, but um, to our kind of, um, of um, setting the rules for our own life and not delivering it to a technology.
fully now unmuted now so the, the good thing I'm, I'm very happy about is firstly sort of you know we both we all three share a deep concern for liberalism for democracy for for you know the avoidance of coming about of totalitarian or paternalistic structures so that is that is i think a deep concern of all of us the way to reach this is is a different um which is connected to different understanding of who we are as human beings in the end um and yes it's it's not it's not just francesco you mentioned sort of it's anthropocentrism versus It's of outlook. It's it's an in between a Can you smile? No, it's back. I'm back. Okay. I don't know when I was interested. Yeah. So uh, the understanding of nice. So one one second. There's a audio. Can you hear me? Now I can see you. Now you can hear me again. Good. So it was some some sort of interruption. I don't know when it started. Um, anyway, um, so the understanding. I don't share. Um, I don't see AI as, as, as a type of hyperhumanism necessarily connected to it. Um, and that is actually connected to the underlying thought, um, we have always been cyborgs, which exactly tries to stress that. It also moves, it's non-dualistic thinking. It moves beyond the di dichotomy as... You, you need to explain why. Yeah, that's, 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 that's what I'm doing. Um, um, it moves beyond the dichotomy of technology being a function or a means to reach something and the understanding of technology always being a part in changing who we are i think it's both it always has to be both um, and that also applies to artificial intelligence and that is connected to this underlying revised different understanding of who we are as human beings we've always been cyborgs cyborgs literally means kubernetes organisms um, Kubernetes, ancient Greek, comes from the steersman, the helmsman of a ship. Uh, organisms, so we are steered organisms. We've always been steered organisms. What does it mean? Where does our rationality come from? Whereas in, in the alternative suggestion, in the dominant suggestion in the Western cultural tradition, it's a divine spark, it's God-given, it comes from outside, it's something immaterial which makes us stick out. And that's the basis of all the discriminatory structures I've, I've originally mentioned, from sexism, racism, to heteronormativity and so on. Um, at least it developed these connotations as part of the cultural development. And the counter, counter suggestions that as us as cyborgs, our reason reason is our capacity to talk to communicate to make inferences where do we get that from we don't get that from god from the divine spark from outside but we get that from our parents from our cultural surroundings up learning a language as part of a culture as parents teaching us is part of an enhancement process education is enhancement we get upgraded toward with reason but it's not the same reason in all of us. We all got our individual idiosyncratic reasons as part of the edu educational process. And that is sort of the evolutionary alternative. And th but that's, that's a fundamental different understanding. I, and it's really rooted at the heart of the understanding, which, um, which understanding of human beings do we have? 
And yeah, um, that has a lot of further implications. But coming to the questions concerning um, the outlook, best and, and worst one, I'm not making predictions concerning, I'm not, I'm not envisioning a future, but what I can do is sort of based on the current situations, um, what, what, what are the most worrisome developments and the best possible developments given the current, current situation? Because I don't, I'm, not, I'm never making predictions of the future because they are always false. Um, it is, it, that couldn't be done on a scientific basis, basically. Um, the best, uh, the most worrisome outcome would be. Sorry, one second. Did you lose the connection? No, huh? yeah. yeah. So a worrying outcome comes, uh, goes along with the understanding um, that we are losing Europe is by not having access using the digital data um, is, is, is losing is the economic well-being, scientific well-being and everything which goes along with that. And as a consequence, um, you know, that will affect the population. And first of all, probably the middle class, when the middle class is worse off, at least um, not even absolutely, but only relatively speaking with sort of the, with US Americans or Eastern Asians, you know, they will feel bad about it. They look for scapegoats. They look for someone to blame. And that will lead to internal tensions, maybe even civil war. And the best possible. <laughs> okay. okay. Just briefly. No, 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 no. We need to have an equal balance. Of okay. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the microphone myself. Uh, can you turn off your mic? Okay, you. Because otherwise we're going to echo. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm still uh, not convinced, right? Uh, from neither of your views, right? Let me explain. So you seem to be very vocal. So when I listen to what you say, it seems to be uh, very clear to me that there's two core uh, concepts. Uh, one is, uh, uh, well, one that I profoundly shared, the, the idea that democracy is imperfect, but it's a, uh, it's a fundamental achieving for humanity. Uh, the other is that uh, uh, AI is a threat to that concept, to that uh, way of living, right? Um, Stefan, you, you seem to be uh, kind of uh, to be agreeing with them, right? You, you seem to say that you value your privacy, uh, you value the fact that uh, um, uh, there's a negative forms of control. So you seem to share the same uh, negative scenarios, uh, I, but I don't quite see where the positive scenarios of both of you are going to go. I mean, I basically, in, in, a, in your future world, in 10 years from now, uh, what is the positive contribution of uh, uh, any development to artificial intelligence uh, to your own conception of humanity? And is, is there, there any, any that you seem to articulate that the contributes to maintaining democracy and, and doing, doing what else? else? I, mean, I mean, let's, let's say, say that we maintain democracy, democracy right? right? We design a system, system where we, we, uh, we keep control of the machine, basically. It seems to be the core concept you, you are pushing forward is uh, uh, we need to be in control of the genie, uh, basically, no? Uh, but <laughs> I'm really struggling to understand what, what, what is it that you want this genie to do? Because you talk about universal health care and, 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 and everything uh, connected to it as a, a fundamental thing to achieve, for example, right? Um, and you seem to be talking about the concept of, uh, let's say, uh, being a better human. Huh? Okay, so I'll, give, me, give me practical examples of, uh, of what you mean by these uh, positive scenarios. Let me, let me understand better what is it that we want to achieve and, and you have been already talking so we'll go back to <laughs> matthias yeah. yes that means bring out One the best second. yeah i have to mute myself otherwise we're going to 
It's, it's exactly what you said, Francesco. It, it means bring out the best in humans instead of turning them into cyborgs. Um, so that means um, humanity, um, you, you, you say that, that reason. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. Let, let me articulate. Because uh, if the concept is to create an alternative to a human, right? Then we don't need that. We already have a way to generate other humans, right? If we want to make better humans, let's create better communications between humans. Uh, that's uh, what Paul was saying. We, the, the, the best, yeah, so uh, that's a better human, right? Yeah. So how does, how does AI contribute to this better human that you're defining? Because for example, I totally agree. So one of the beauty of democracy, you know what it is, is that we can argue without killing each other because basically we agree to disagree and to have uh, the, the force of our argument needs to be based on the ability to convince others, right? I mean, this is a democratic concept. Well, some people can argue, well, I have the right opinion. I'm gonna use artificial intelligence to convince as many people of my opinion, <laughs> right? I would like to say that at least I don't see myself in the business of marketing AI technology. Mm, you know, I mean, uh, you know, the engineers will find solutions to some problems. And if they're able to convince people that these solutions are good, then this technology will play its role like any other technology. But I don't think it's important in our thinking to now find positive examples of you know, what, what technology and AI in particular could do. I mean, you know, the marketing machinery of the GAFAM, they're doing that at nausea. The job of democracy is to solve human problems. It's not to use AI to its best potential. And, and this is, let's say, the fallacy in many of these AI discussions that, you know, we are asked, now find example of what good AI could be doing. No, I am in the business of defining you know, which issues of human existence and of state and community and democracy need to be addressed and how, and maybe AI can contribute. And I have to hear that from the engineers and from those who want to sell that solution, how it can contribute. But maybe there are also other solutions. I mean, you know, we had the discussions in COVID, you know, what brought the solutions and the progress on COVID? It was a mixture between rules, the ability to agree on the rule that we must have distance between us, that we vaccinate each other, uh, uh, ourselves and that we wear masks when we're inside rooms was probably more important than any of the technological elements. Yeah, so it's a classic example of, you know, avoiding to run on the wrong track because at the beginning, you know, there were many people who said, oh, you know, digital and the app will solve it all. It didn't, it didn't. So, you know, I must say, I refuse to fall into a debate of technical solutionism in which I'm on the block to now identify where I, AI can do this or that. No, let the producers 